So here's the thing. There are over 7 billion people on Earth today. Each of us has the chance to make a difference, to show the world what we can do. So, where will you go? Who will you be? What do you dream about when you're not thinking about, I don't know, the math test you have to take on Thursday? What do you want to be? When I grow up? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what I want to do, but I'm still trying to figure that out. I want to be a lot of stuff. I want to start my own company. When I grow up, I don't know what I want to be. I actually want to become an art teacher. NFL football player. What do you guys dream about? I mean, when my mind wanders, it's like, I want to be out of school. <laughs> Wait, stop. We can't, we can't really talk about where you want to go unless we first establish where you are, right? Seems logical to me. Okay, so where are you? You know, the you-ness of you. What part of us is most essentially, indispensably, us? Our stomachs? <laughs> Sometimes. What about our hearts? Yeah, what about our hearts? So delicate, so strong. That's what Aristotle thought, anyway. He thought our whole soul and essence was right there, in the heart. Mm. Nope, sorry, Aristotle. We know today that even if you traded hearts with a serial killer, you would still just be the same friendly neighbor in the same friendly neighborhood. I mean, not my neighborhood, obviously. I mean, I don't, I don't want you living near me if you have a serial killer heart. Just in case you try to stab me. <clears throat> so, where are we? There it is. Your wonderful, mind-boggling brain. Is your brain you? Are, are you your brain? I have no earthly idea. But it is the command center. Somehow everything you learn, everything you want, everything you need, dream, or remember is contained right there in that three-pound zombie snack between your ears. <sighs> So listen up, my little zombie snacks. I've got a story to tell you. You probably already know where I'm going with this, right? Yep, exactly. Once upon a time, there was a man named Phineas Gage. I mean, it wasn't just once upon a time, per se. It was 1848, and it was Vermont. But I'm trying to set the mood here, so go with me. Phineas was a railroad worker. Back in those days, if you wanted to get through a giant boulder or cliff, you did it by drilling a hole in the rock filling it with gunpowder and a fuse, then filling the rest of the hole with sand, and finally, packing it all down nice and tight with a heavy metal rod. Well, on this particular day, Phineas got distracted. Yoo-hoo! And forgot to put in the sand. When Phineas smashed the iron rod into the hole, it made a spark, which ignited the gunpowder. The explosion blasted the iron rod upward, right through Phineas's brain and then fell back to Earth some distance from his body, which was lying on the ground just completely still alive. Amazingly, Phineas Gage recovered and lived another 12 years. Which back then, you know, 12 years is nothing to sneeze at, guys. Except the townsfolk said that Phineas Gage's personality had changed. They said he had become moody and crude, that he used foul language he'd never used before. They were forced to conclude that he was, and I quote, not the same Gage. Oh, and here's the iron rod that went through his head, if you were curious. Looks like they worked things out. So, why are we really talking today about Phineas Gage? Because damaging his brain didn't just hurt Phineas, it changed Phineas. And the truth is, there are a lot of ways to change our brains. Ways that don't require explosions to get inside. A lot of times, we invite them in ourselves. And once they're in, they rewire the way we think. And just like Phineas Gage's iron bar, that rewiring can change us in very fundamental ways. Okay, so this is my cat, White Boy. Is that offensive that I say White Boy? No. Okay. okay. I'm Charisse, and I love traveling, dancing. <laughs> eating, sleeping, and traveling. I think I said that. I'm a student um, here in Buffalo at the university. I'm studying social work. When I first saw porn, um, I was about 10. It was a picture. I went from seeing the pictures to watching the movies, and I started secluding myself, isolating myself. I had to watch at least once, twice a day. That's where it all just kind of got out of control. 
Now look, porn is going to affect different people in different ways, and we're not here today to talk about whether porn is evil or whether it should be outlawed. We're simply asking, what does porn do to you? How does it affect your health and happiness? Because there are plenty of people in the world throughout history eager to mislead you about whether something can hurt you. For example, let's take a look at what they used to sell on the old frontier when you had a toothache. There you go. Yes, that does say cocaine. And yes, those are little kids in the picture. One drop of this and you won't care about that toothache anymore. You won't even care whether you have teeth. Or how about this one? Yep, you read that right. Asthma cigarettes effectively treats asthma, hay fever, and foul breath. That's what your English teachers refer to as irony, kids. But hey, it's not all bad. Look, at least they're not giving them to five-year-olds. The point is this. Sometimes science has to catch up with the truth. And even then, it often takes a while for the rest of us to catch up with science. From the global resources of ABC News, this is Nightline. Pornography. Hollywood's X-rated cousin is a $12 billion American industry. There are an estimated 370 million pornographic websites on the internet. Pornography is becoming as easy to find as fast food. Porn is easier to access than ever. Just like with those companies of the last century, there is a massive effort in the multi-billion dollar porn industry today to convince you that porn is harmless, even good for you. But slowly and steadily, science is catching up with the truth that the effects of porn are far more substantial than what you're being led to believe. This is my car, her name is Sheila. She has long flowing hair. If cars did have hair, she has it. And she drives majestically like a Pegasus. My name is Ryan. I live in Scottsdale, Arizona. I am 21 years old, but my beard makes me look like I'm like 37. I have been a drummer for 11 years. Right now I play with three of my really good friends and we just kind of jam out and have fun. It's a place where really I can be free. I can just be me and not have to worry about the things around me. Back when I was about 10 years old, I was on the internet and I caught one glimpse of pornography. For me, there was that slight guilt, but I just justified it by saying, oh, well, it feels great, so I'm just gonna keep looking at it. It just went from one picture to another to another, and it was just like an endless, vast ocean of sex. Pornography affected the way I thought and behaved. It changed the way I viewed girls. It started to kind of put them as objects of my use. It's a rewiring process. We call it neuroplastic process. Just as plastic is changeable and malleable, we can change the shape of the brain. That's Dr. Donald L. Hilton, Jr. He's a neurosurgeon and is an adjunct associate professor of neurosurgery at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. That is a mouthful, but listen to him because he's a smart guy. According to him, your brain is what, what's that word again? Malleable. Okay, so what he's saying is that your brain is less like this and more like this. Well, if you want to get all literal about it, your brain's actually more like this. That's tofu for all you carnivores out there. That's what they say your brain feels like. But we're not talking about texture. We're talking about the fact that your brain is, you know, constantly changing and molding itself. Neuroscientists call it plasticity, meaning everything you want, everything you need, everything you do causes your brain to make little pathways and connections inside itself so it can do it faster next time. Learn an instrument, play a sport, learn to do the Charleston. Here's the point. Your brain can change itself. It can be a different brain today than it was yesterday. We can train our brain in something and then grow that area, which means we have more capacity in that area um, to process incoming stimuli. So if you train a lot of math, your brain area um, responsible for math calculation is going to grow and you're going to get better at this. That's Dr. Kuhn of the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin. Or for you German speakers out there, the Max Planck Institute für Bildungsforschung, Dieber. <clears throat> Anyway, she's gonna tell us what all this plasticity talk has to do with porn. Everything that we do each and every day shapes our brain to the thing that it is. So if I really like sports, I will have brain regions dedicated for swimming and stuff. If I, on the other hand, watch a lot of porn, I will train my brain regions responsible for porn processing a lot more. 
Wow, a brain trained to process porn. I suppose someone could hear that and think it sounded pretty cool, but let's listen to someone who actually knows how it feels. Horrible, flat, and nothing. There's completely no enjoyment in anything. My name's Dan, I'm 22 years old. I teach piano and I work out and I go and see friends. I'm writing a book, <laughs> so I have, I have quite a lot of projects. <laughs> I didn't think that I'd ever have turned out like this. I started watching porn in my teenage years and it made me feel probably the worst feeling of emptiness where you feel this kind of wrenching, heart-wrenching kind of sadness or sorrow but you can't do anything about it. You can't, you can't even feel it but you know it's there. You know it's the only thing there and it consumes you but there's nothing. You just, you can't even, you're just numb to it or it's completely flat. You're just like a robot. I never realized, like, the stuff it, like, how it changed my mind and how it changed the way I viewed people and how it changed my expectations and how it changed, I mean, everything about me besides, I mean, besides my physical appearance. Like, it, it changed mentally, like, it just kind of ripped me apart. It just became this, like, twisted thing and it just wasn't good. Like, that was my thing that I went to when I wanted to feel good and when I wanted to, you know, feel complete. And then it just, it made me feel like there was nothing. If this isn't good, then nothing's good. So let's get into specifics here. Let's talk about the first major way porn can rewire your brain. Everyone knows that images can hold enormous power. They can change our whole concept of beauty, body type, and what we consider normal. But why is that? Nicholas Tinbergen was a biologist who received the Nobel Prize in the 1970s. He's most famous for coining the term supernormal stimulus, which is really just a fancy way of describing something that is bigger and greater than what someone would see in their normal, everyday, natural lives. In one of his most famous experiments, he took butterflies where the males were attracted to the color, pattern, and shape of the female's wings. He then made cardboard butterfly wings, and he painted them brighter and, and made them bigger than nature ever would. So get this, and this is a real story. The male butterflies tried to mate with the cardboard. In fact, even when females were present, the males would ignore them and stay focused on the cardboard. That's kind of insane, right? What Tinbergen discovered about the brain was that it could be manipulated by doing the following. First, figure out what stimulates the brain. Second, create an exaggerated version. And third, the brain will often come to prefer the exaggerated version. It's important to remember that this is a biological discovery about the way the brain, any brain, works, whether it belongs to a butterfly or a human. Don't believe me? Back in the day, this is the amount of sugar in the average diet. This is the amount today. Pretty stark difference, huh? What about what fashion dolls look like 50 years ago? This is what they look like today. This is what an action figure looked like in the 80s. Here's what they look like today. Wow, they've got muscles on their muscles. You see, wherever we have the opportunity to exaggerate what stimulates or entices us, we take it. But remember the third final piece of Tinbergen's discovery. Eventually, we prefer the supernormal stimuli and we ignore what's normal for what's exaggerated. So what about porn? What are the normal stimuli that porn exaggerates? Um, I started watching probably normal porn and then it quickly escalated to um, more extreme stuff. I try out pretty much anything, not because I found it a turn on, just because it shocked me. If there's anything that shocked me, I would just be watching it. I think about when I was a little girl and how I used to think about like my first kiss and, and like holding hands with a guy and how simple, innocent things like that were so exciting. And what porn did was that it twisted that thinking. It twisted it into thinking that, you know, all this crazy genres and, and of sex were romantic and were exciting and were fun and were fulfilling. But I really felt empty and I felt like I was never satisfied. It was just exhausting. It was really exhausting. Um, I 
I wish that I never went through this. I never wish I saw that first picture. I never wish I watched that first video. I never wish I never wanted any of this. So. A new phenomenon is happening in which I've tried to sound an alarm because it's not temporary, it's not a phase. Young men and women's lives are being ruined by excessive pornography. That's Dr. Philip Zimbardo of Stanford University. For the last few years, his research has focused on the psychological impact of gaming and pornography on today's rising generation. Porn has these adverse effects because it's captivating, it's enchanting. You're focusing, you're focusing on this screen right here. Uh, and you're eliminating everything else in the universe. And I've said everything else in the universe is called life. Hijacking is a great way to put it because when you hijack something, you take it from going where it's supposed to go and send it to someplace else. That's Dr. William Struthers. He's a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Wheaton College in Illinois. He teaches a course on the biological basis of behavior. Uh, a neurological system that is designed to go to a place where two people are bound to one another, you're now redirecting it so that their sexuality is binding them to something other than that relationship. It was something that made me feel good and it was something that I just kept pushing for because it was like, if I'm feeling bad, I can go to this because it makes me feel great. Um, and as time went on and I got deeper and deeper into this stuff, um, I, I, wanted, I wanted more. In a sense, I became addicted to pornography. Okay, so there it is, the word you've probably been expecting. We've come now to the single most well-known topic when it comes to pornography, this word, addiction. It's what most people expect in a presentation about porn, especially porn in the brain. There is compelling academic research that confirms pornography addiction is every bit as real as drug addiction, and some question whether addiction is the best word to describe it. But what is not in dispute are the hundreds of thousands of people in the world right now experiencing what they feel is an uncontrollable need for porn. Once I found pornography, it was just downhill. From the first time I watched it, I was hooked. I really hooked. I watched it about three more times that day, and then every day after that, pretty much for six years. I felt like I had to watch it at least once a day, probably multiple times a day. Every justification that I made, it, I became deeper and deeper and deeper in, into this stuff. And it was just kind of like this constant battle to justify this stuff. And I didn't know the effects that it was having on me and the things that it was doing to me. I realized that I had lost myself um, and, and I just lost a lot of my self-control. It was really hard. It was really hard. Again, we're not saying that everyone is impacted by porn in the same way. We're just sharing real people's experiences and what real studies have shown. So what it basically comes down to are these two major parts of your brain, the reward center and the prefrontal cortex. Let's talk about the reward center first. Stay with me here and get a little science-y. We have a dopamine factory in this very primitive old part of our brain, and it sends brain wires up to this reward area. And it literally powers the brain with desire. So basically everything that people seek to pursue is something that is driven by the reward center. That lower reward part of your brain is not unique to humans. It wants what every mammal wants. To live, to reproduce, to be comfortable. Think of all the things in life you love to do. Yep, it's that reward part of your brain that seeks those things. That's why they feel good. So now let's talk about the upper part. And then we have the prefrontal cortex on the other side that basically regulates these reward-seeking structures. If the lower part of your brain is something you share with every mammal, the upper part is what makes you human. When you think, when you reason, when you weigh the consequences, you're using that upper part of your brain. Normally, the prefrontal cortex keeps the reward center in check. The reward center says, I wanna eat an entire pizza. The prefrontal cortex says, maybe I should just have a couple slices. The reward center says, I want to sleep until noon. The prefrontal cortex says, if I keep missing school, I won't graduate. The point is, the relationship can change between these two when we view porn. In a sense, if the brain is a car, that frontal executive system is a brake. And it's like the brake pads wear out with addiction. They don't work as well. 
The brain doesn't stop as well. It just winds. We basically illustrate that the more pornography people watch, the less strong the link is between the reward system and the prefrontal cortex. And um, pretty much my hypothesis was that the ventral striatum and the reward uh, regions should be bigger in those people watching pornography. And it's exactly the other way around. So, um... Pretty sharp. Yes, yes. <laughs> Even when I was not in front of the computer or whatever, I was thinking about it. I was just like, okay, what am I gonna look up later? Everything was clouded by these thoughts and by the images that had been like kind of ingrained in me. Like I couldn't not watch it. So that in a nutshell is the final way that porn can affect the brain. Call it addiction, call it compulsion. Some people refer to it as the amygdala hijack, which would be a great band name, by the way. It's when the part of our brain that wants something overpowers the part that thinks through the consequences. And hey, if you are one of the many people experiencing what feels like a loss of control, don't be ashamed and don't keep it a secret. Talk to someone. You'll be surprised how much the people around you understand and want to help. You don't have to deal with it alone. Pornography started to you know, give me that, that desire to do more, to want more than just pictures and just videos. And that's when I, you know, I made a dumb decision. When I was 13, I was arrested for touching a girl younger than I was on two different occasions. When I was put in that jail cell, it was a terrifying experience. It was just this little tiny, like metal bunk beds, jail cell. I didn't know how long I was gonna be in there for either. I was a 13 year old kid and it was rough. And so from that moment on, that's where my fight began. No one realizes what this stuff does. I didn't know as a kid growing up, I would have never known. Mentally, like it just kind of ripped me apart. Now I work with youth and it's cool to help them fight this pornography battle because it's not one that's, that's fun to fight alone. I'm 21 and you know, the battle isn't gone. It didn't leave, it didn't just get up and say, okay, I'm done. It doesn't stop when you know, you clap your hands or you make a wish. Um, you know, I'm not trying to sound negative, but this, this pornography is a battle and I don't want to go back. And it's a battle which I'm willing to fight. When you're deep in the trenches of viewing pornography, stopping it is going to be really, really difficult. The pornography that you're watching is usually meeting some need in your life. So one of the ways that you can really speed up in the recovery process is that you can find better ways to meet those needs. It's like eating a Snickers bar when your body really needs a salad. So replacing what you've been putting into your body with what is actually needed is actually gonna make you be healthy. I remember one day, it was a normal day, and I knew I was gonna watch porn, but for the first time I finally like said it out loud. I said, I hate this, I hate porn, I hate doing this, I hate being a slave to this. And I just kind of broke down. I broke down and I, I realized that it wasn't me that was bad, it was the porn. So now, um, my addiction is under control. It's so much better, but it's still a struggle, of course. There was a month recently that I um, fell back into watching porn and it was hard. Even with the most severe drug addictions, studies have shown that the brain can recover. An interesting study showed that with a year or two of recovery, these shrunken areas actually enlarged again, back to more normal volumes. So we know the brain heals. We've actually been able to visualize recovery. So I sat down and I just started like just crying, just just this just this just this rush of just tears. And I couldn't believe I saw so blind to see that this was a serious problem in my life. I was so desperate to recover. I was watching porn every day for six years, like twice, three times a day sometimes. And then I was watching porn maybe once a month, and then I stopped watching porn, and then I'd relapse. So this 
you know, took away my teenage years of, that I could have been enjoying. And um, eventually with time it sort of became easier to stop it. You know, and I just knew that there was hope for the first time in my life. There was hope, there was like a light at the end of the tunnel. And then I met my girlfriend and there was just this connection and I, I wanted to kiss her and do these things, and, which I hadn't felt before, not for many, many years. And it was like, felt human again. I hadn't felt human for a long time and I felt human again. I can't, I can't put it into words. It's something very beyond words, really. So now I'm much happier, I feel free, I feel um, like a weight's been lifted off me. But it's still a struggle. I get really easily triggered, I guess you could say. Things just bother me, like certain music, pictures, movies, there are certain things I just don't allow in my life. Life is easier without porn. I can have friends. I can trust people now. I just feel almost complete again. No matter how dark or depressed, your brain has the power to heal and return itself to the healthy, happy functioning state you crave. Phineas had to live with his injury for the rest of his life, but the effects of pornography don't have to be permanent. Here's the real question though. If porn really does rewire the brain in unhealthy ways, then what are the consequences of so many people watching it? Last year, over four billion hours of porn were viewed on one website. Four billion, with a B. How will all that porn affect the viewers? How will it affect their boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives, and families? How will it affect the world? be a Marine. I'd like to be a journalist. I want to go to college for film and arts. I want to make cartoons. I want to be an aircraft mechanic. I like to play video games, that's for sure. I want to be a performer in New York City. Um, ultimately, I want to be a mother. The brain, the heart, the world. These are the three parts of our message. And it all starts here, with the brain. Defend your brain. Treasure it. That's the first step. You were born with a machine in your head more powerful and with more potential than the world's fastest computer, all dedicated to the survival and happiness of you and the ones you love. Your magnificent, mind-boggling brain. Take care of it. It was made to take care of you. <laughs>